that that's not in question. I'm not saying people have treated me poorly, but there was, it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm there. And then immediately, I don't, I think it was Sergio picks up my suitcase and you open the door for me. And there was a certain, and it's not the deference that I'm talking about. It's the, there was a disciplined courtesy. I've had other people carry my, my suitcase before. That's not a big deal. But there was a disciplined courtesy that struck me in one moment and impressed the hell out of me too, by the way. And mm. I was talking to, I think, probably my mom about it a couple of days later. And she's like, yeah, they were in the military. And mm. so I'm, I want to use that as a segue to talk about, and I know that's a trivial example, but no, it's actually it, it's actually really important. It's um it it's um it's it's we so we had a friend who was in town recently, and I, I don't want to get too much into all personal stuff. But what I do want to say is that Sergio and I will often say things to him about just his simple day to day interactions, and those day to day interactions, for instance, when we're at a diner. And a server walks up and, you know, to make eye contact and not to just keep eating if they drop something off at the table without acknowledging their presence, making sure that you do hold doors for people, making sure that you are uh, uh, courteous with people. Like those things for me on a smaller level operate as a form of discipline that then should carry over into other forms. So let's bring this back to military training. So they don't discipline you. So, so let's put it this way. You don't go into boot camp on day one or week one and start patrolling with a weapon in your hand. In fact, as an infantry soldier or a Marine, you're not – as an infantry Marine, and I'll speak just per, to my personal experience, you don't really do that until 16 weeks of training. Actually sit in a formation with a group of people with weapons, let alone live ammunition, which might only happen once over the course of 24 weeks of training. So what do they start you with first? Can you stand up straight? Can you – and I don't mean to sound uh, ableist when I say some of these things, so I just want to throw that out there. Um, but you know, can you stand there on the line? Can you keep a straight face? Can you keep your hands and your knuckles at your – at your uh, seam of your pants, you know, uh, can you fold your socks properly and fold your rack properly? You know, can you make your bed or what we call the rack? You know, can you fold your socks? Can you have everything in line? Can you have your foot locker organized? Can you follow simple commands like yes, yes, sir, after certain commands or kill after other commands? Will you move to the right or to the left when given a command to do so? Now, that is an extreme example, and it's obviously in a very destructive institution, particularly here in the United States. But I think that you could take a lot of those lessons and the fundamentals, which for me mean starting off very small with people. So if you can't be disciplined enough to get up and at least make your bed, at least, you know, maybe get something healthy to eat if you can afford it, if you have access to it, like making little schedules for yourself, making sure um, that you are living up to your commitments and just doing the smaller things that then I think, you know, after weeks and weeks and weeks of training, then finally, as I was explaining to my neighbor who didn't know this the other day, you know, in Marine Corps boot camp, you don't shoot a weapon until I think week 11 of a 13 week boot camp. So you're doing, you're training and learning discipline for 11 weeks before the United States Marine Corps even gives you a weapon to fire. So when I think of resistance movements, when I think of even, say, nonviolent direct action uh, groups who are performing very illegal actions, but say in a nonviolent fashion, but who still face uh, serious repercussions, I think to myself, we need uh, activists and organizations who are uh, disciplined on the same level. And maybe not in the same manner, obviously, but I do think some of those techniques and some of the the, the long view that you know we're not going to just discipline people in the, in the course of a weekend workshop, or we're not just going to discipline people even if you could spend a week with someone. I mean, we're talking about having people for 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 16 weeks before you can trust them enough, and that's under great duress and stress 
for those 16 weeks just to get people to the point where they can walk down a street together and know what to do if someone fires on them. Um, and I don't want to like overly stress that. I don't want to like people who are thinking out there, geez, I just want my group to be a little more disciplined, you know, or I just want to find some discipline for myself to do that. I, that's the ideal, I would say, and I would say that that's a model. But, you know, in any small way, and I think that that extends to day-to-day courtesies, to looking at someone when they're talking to you, to listening to someone who's talking to you, to, to be there in the moment, to, you know, to pay attention to what you're doing and what you're saying and, you know, the 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 way that you're coming across to people. I mean, I think that's a very important thing. Um, and I think that, you know, just starting with those small things like, you know, hell, can I do a half hour of working out today? I don't really like to read, but I know that reading is very good for me. I know my brain is a muscle. I need to work it. Can I at least read for a half hour, 45 minutes a day? Just those little things, I think, if if you stay with them long enough and if you do them, I think they'll have a profound impact on your life. I, I think there's no question about that. Go ahead. Oh, no. No, I was done. I, see, I think this is incredibly important. I think I think this the importance of this cannot be. Uh, oh, go ahead. I was going to say. So the other day, I saw this clip from Oliver Stone, and it was a really good clip and whatever about his movies. And I don't even I don't know him as a person. So if he's an asshole as a person, I apologize. I, I'm just with what he said the other day at some. It was the National Writers Guild Awards, and the gist of what he said. There was like towards the end, he was like, "Look, I've been fighting these people," and I'm paraphrasing, but he was like, "Look, I've been fighting these people who make war my entire life, and most of the time, you're going to get your ass kicked." He's like, "You're going to get insulted. There's people who are going to make threats against you, and there's going to even be people who flatter you. But at the end of the day, if you can stay the course, and if what you if you believe in what you're saying, then you can make a difference." and there's been a lot of people, Derek, over the years. Sergio and I talk about this pretty regularly. I would say 90 to 95 percent of the people that I started doing activist work with no longer do the kind of activist work that Sergio and I are still engaged with. They might be involved on a smaller level, which is still good. Um, they might be doing artistic work, which is all good. All that stuff's good, you know, but in terms of on being at that same level we were at at 22 thinking we want to radically change society and we're not going to deviate from these principles, there's very few of us who've remained. Now, some of that is the toxicity of the left. Some of that is life can beat you down. Some of that is we're living in one of the most fucked up economic periods in U.S. history and all this other stuff. I mean, all that's true, but another large part of that is and this is from seeing people at least anecdotally and i would like to see a study on this but just how many people sort of fell away because they couldn't maintain some level of discipline that like no like i have it in my head that this is what i'm doing for the rest of my life like that this isn't i'm not just blowing smoke up your ass i'm not just saying that at the pub because we're having a few beers i'm not just saying that to make you happy i'm not just saying that because that's what i think i want to hear but i have seriously sat back and meditated and thought to myself okay maybe meditation is the wrong word because i'm not really into some of those things i am that's a different story nonetheless sat there and reflected and thought to yourself is this what i'm seriously all about and why because it better not be for you know, whatever, uh, a career or book deals or to get your name in the newspaper or to appear on radio programs. If it's for those reasons, you're in the wrong fucking line of business and I don't want to be around you. And number two, you're going to fall away anyway, because this work, as most people know who do it, is very difficult. It is time consuming and it is extremely stressful and it can beat you down. Um, It is very, it is on the flip side, very rewarding. You meet amazing people you get to participate in very meaningful activities uh you don't have to look back as many of my friends are doing in their early 30s and asking god what the hell did i do with my 20s and god what the hell did i do for the last decade uh i haven't asked that question i mean are there things i would have done better i mean of course i'm not crazy i mean uh, there's plenty of things i mean that's for me part of being disciplined is you know, it's not that you're going to always be this perfect person. It's that you're going to notice when you start screwing up. It's like, you know, I know I need to get back into shape right now. <laughs> I know that that's the case. I'm not in the kind of shape I need to be in. So what's that going to require? That's going to require me clamping down sort of on myself. So, you know, I just think little things like that is like, 
and even showing up to stuff that sometimes you don't want to, you know, for the activists who are out there and so on, you know, and I have to be reminded of this when I watch those old video clips and I see someone, and I need to find her name, like the woman from the Mississippi Freedom Party who was telling people at a, like, just regular rally, folks dressed like they're going to church, you're going to have to put your lives on the line. I mean, I, that kind of stuff, it's not like, I, you know, I have to, that kind of stuff reminds me. That kind of stuff inspires me. You know, the other day when I saw clips of disabled people, people who are terminally ill, being dragged out of senators' offices just because they need their Medicaid and their medic, like their health care, that stuff not only enrages me, those images and those kinds of actions inspire me. I mean, how can you not be the least bit inspired? How can you not, how can I look at someone who's terminally ill in a goddamn wheelchair and I'm sitting there at home going, man, I really don't know if I want to go to this meeting tonight, like, or I really don't know if I want to go to this action next week or whatever. It's like, no, like, okay, sometimes you got to take your break so you don't burn out. But a lot of times I think we make a lot of excuses for people and I actually think it's insulting. It's not like we understand these are systemic issues, but I've had people tell me, well, you know, they're poor immigrants. Like we can't expect them to stand up. And, and, and I'm like, do you understand how patronizing that is? Like do you understand how offensive that is? Like, like, like there's not tons of immigrant families who are already standing up. Like what about – how about we highlight their work? How about we use them as an example and not – you know, sit back and with this, I don't even know, like goofy mentality go, oh, well, you know, we can't expect them to stand up like they're in this position. It's like, no, that's, <coughs> we, we can never, I don't think we should ever do that. I don't think that's what good organizers are. I don't think that's what good leaders, intellectual, cultural, political leaders do. I think they say, hey, I understand your situation. Maybe I'm even in your situation, but regardless, I'm here to walk with you, to work with you hand in hand, and this is what we're going to do. I'm not going to say, hey, well, you know, it's a it's a bad systemic problem and I don't really expect you to do much about it because you're in this terrible state. I mean, I think of other situations. I think if you can resist slavery, I mean, abolitionists, I mean, oh, I just I just think of the, I think those things fire me up because I think, man, if these people could do what they did under those circumstances, then damn it. Like we I, I can't make excuses for myself. And I can't run away and I can't make excuses for other people. I just, you know, if people need to take breaks, like I said, I understand that. But at the end of the day, we need to be holding those people up as examples. We don't need to be sitting back and saying, well, you know, Derek, um, he has health problems. So, you know, I don't expect him really to write that much or I don't expect him to do anything. I mean, yeah, I mean, a lot of us have health problems and to varying degrees, we can all put in what we could put in. But I do think all of us, including myself, need people other than just ourselves, to push us. And that's why I love people like Sergio or my dad or my mom or other people who are like, hey, Vince, you know, you could be doing a little more. Or, hey, you know, you could help this out more. Or, you can – that's the kind of – that to me is real friendship. It's not just sitting there going, oh, Derek, you know, you're the greatest person in the world and you don't do anything wrong. I mean it's like, hey, if we spend enough time around each other where we're comfortable enough to have those conversations, that's what good activism is. That's what good organiz- organizing is. I mean – Building trust, I think, also includes critiques, and as long as they're done with solidarity in mind and, and with you know good intentions, I think that's what it's all about. I mean, we to me we should always be critiquing and and you know improving as much as we can, because obviously we're not winning with what we're doing now. Well, we have about um, we have about oh gosh, five or six minutes left, and there's there's. I wanted to, we just have to save self-defense for another time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, I mean, there's, there's. I'm sorry. I've been, I'm, no, 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 I'm this is perfect. This today. is great. This is, this is wonderful. And the, the, another thing that you, you, you brought up that I also want to just say, but I want to save for another time because I know you're going to have a lot of great things to say about it is something else that's very clear in the military, at least from reading military history, which is all I've ever done is that it's very clear that if there's a war, you want to win. And mm-hmm. the, the other day, so I'm, I'm reading a book right now. Well, okay, I'm going to back up. I'm just going to ramble for a couple minutes. Yeah. One of them is, one thing is uh, having to do with the discipline. One reason I have so many books out is surprisingly enough because I write. <laughs> and, you know, that's it. You know, it's, it's a cliche, but my, my, Mother's grandmother used to say all the time, inch by inch, life's a cinch. 
And so I don't write whole books. It's just like today. Today, already today, I have um, typed in edits I made on um, today. It was 40 some pages. And I did those edits over the previous three or four days of about 90 pages. And now I'm going to print those out. I'm going to read it again tonight. And then tomorrow I will type in those changes. And then I'm done with that 90 pages. I mean, obviously, I'd be written in the first place. But the point is, I do work every day. And another thing I want to say about that that has to do with the whole reading thing is one of the smartest things I did when I was a teenager is I decided that every night before I went to bed, I would read 10 pages of a book that was good for me that I would never get through otherwise. Hmm. And it's pretty extraordinary that if you do 10 pages every night, which is a piece of cake, um, <coughs> then in a year you've got 3,600 pages. And that's a bunch of books. So I've read Oswald Spengler that way. The first one I ever read was, was um, Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Um, and then when I was like 20, I read all of Edward Gibbons' Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And it's not a big deal. It was just 10 pages a night, slow but sure. And why am I bringing all this up? Oh, the reason I'm bringing all this up is because right now I'm reading a book called Thunder on the Dnieper, which is about um, the Russian defense against Operation Barbarossa when the Germans invaded in World War II. And there was a question asked early on. I'm just going to say this now. We don't have time to deal with it, but I want to ask you this question for an entire interview sometime in the future. And the early on in the book, they're saying a military maxim is don't do what your enemy expects. And I read that and I don't really kind of, I don't really 100% agree with that because if you have a really defensible position and your enemy expects you to defend it, you may as well if it's really defensible, if it's the best place. Instead, the question I'm interested in is what does your enemy most fear? Hmm. And then do that. And hmm. I asked this on, on on Facebook. I asked just people in general, and it was so interesting because the responses by most of the by many of the people were things like um, building an alternative currency, um, not spending money. And there was one person said, "Destroy the transportation infrastructure that allows the movement of resources." And I clicked on the guy. And he's ex-military. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, that's not surprising. <laughs> yeah. So at some point, and I realize this is the total crap thing to do in this interview, and we have like one minute left. I would like for you, if you don't mind, to think about that question. If you were in power, what would you most fear? And then I would love to interview you again in the future on that question. Right on. I would love to do it. Okay, so, so far as settling down today... Um, can you, we can't really talk about self-defense cause we only have like two minutes. But well, here's the best yes, quote please. I can give you that would, I think encompass everything that we're doing. And it's a good old jujitsu quote that is attributable to no one. No one knows where it came from. And the quote is very simple. It is, or the saying is very simple. It's simply a black belt is a white belt that never stopped coming to practice. And that's all a black belt is in jujitsu. Every single day or as many times as you can go, there's people who get it in eight years. There's people who get it in 25 years. But the point is, is to just get up and do it and do as much as you can and show up when you can and try and make that a